My name is Penny Edmark. Uh, today is March 29th, 2023, and I am gathered here today with uh, Max James, the author of The Harder I Fall, The Higher I Bounce. Uh, how are you today, Max? I'm doing just fine. Absolutely fine. Thanks, Penny. That's wonderful. Um, could you do me a favor and introduce a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your book as well? Uh, we don't have time for all that, but I'll give it a try. Okay. Uh, sure. Uh, Max James, uh, retired, uh, except for helping get this product called The Harder I Fall, The Higher I Bounce, out to the public that I think will benefit from it. I grew up on a farm in Tennessee, uh, ended up going to the Air Force Academy, off to Vietnam, got shot down a couple of times, came back as a combat instructor pilot, uh, went to work for the world's richest man for a few years, and then uh, decided I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So that got me started and uh, uh, started with lots of failures and a few successes and finally ended up selling my company to Nestle in, uh, about five years ago and uh, ended up, uh, the company did $1.8 billion in revenue in, in about 15 years. That's very impressive. Uh, Thank you. Um, so uh, what is your book about? Uh, the harder I fall, the higher I bounce. What is the premise? The premise really is that I learned from all of my failures. And I found humor in most of the failures, at least looking back. And so the book is bit basically a business memoir, I guess. It's the closest thing you could identify it, what category. But it's about all my failures. And they're humorous stories about how I failed in different uh, business endeavors as an entrepreneur, and how I bounced back, how I came back from failing and, uh, and leading to other successes. It's a lot easier uh, to uh, fail than it is to succeed, as I have learned. But every time there were lessons that I learned, things that I should not have done that I did, and things that I did do that was right. And so in each one of the humorous stories about me falling, there is a principle which helped me bounce back on the next endeavor uh, uh, to a little higher success. Okay, I see. So uh, your book is basically about uh, nothing ever knocked you down. Well, I got knocked down, but I got up. Okay, I see. So nothing knocked you down permanently. That's right. That's better. Okay. How many books have you written so far? Um, and well, which one of those books was your favorite? I guess, like most authors, the last one is usually the favorite, but the last one is my first one, and there probably won't be any more. Uh, I, a debut author. Yeah, I was talked into doing this, um, encouraged to do it. I've always been a storyteller, and people have said all along, said, oh my goodness, Max, you ought to write a book about all this. Well, I, when I retired, I thought, you know, maybe it's time to give that a try. Quite honestly, Penny, I didn't know whether or not I could take this verbal storytelling uh, skill uh, and put it into uh, onto paper so that it would still come across as interesting and hopefully beneficial. So I took some tests actually about writing and passed them. And so that encouraged me along with a lot of people to go ahead and give this a shot. So it took me uh, three years, but I got it done. Three years is a long time. Well, it is. It means that you put a lot of thought and a lot of effort into the book, though. I think that's true. Certainly a lot of thought. The effort is uh, maybe a different story for reasons that still aren't clear to me. And I realize that may be one of the things you want to talk about. But uh, I had a hard time going to the computer and getting started. I don't know why. Uh, I had all these stories and I did outline them. Uh, in, uh, in notes on paper before I tried to write the book so I, that I could remember all of the stories about my failures and then I could put them in some kind of organizational effort. And it really is kind of chronological, i.e. I started on the farm as a kid and I ended up as this old man you're talking to uh, writing the book. And uh, so I don't know why I had a hard time getting to the computer 
But once I got to the computer and started, I enjoyed it. It was like telling the story. It was like reliving the story. And so that was kind of the effort that I put into it and, and the way I went about writing the book. That actually answered one of the questions that I had. Um, I wanted right. to ask you what you struggled with while you were writing. Um, on the other hand, I'd like to ask, what was your favorite part about writing this book? You know, it was kind of looking back over your life. And in some instances where you really got into telling the story, it was like reliving it. And it's always fun. You know, at, at my age, 81, it's... Uh, you sometimes spend more time looking backwards than you do forward. And so it was enjoyable to reminisce, to go back and think about the times on the farm when I was following those two gray mules in the fields, uh, dusty fields of West Tennessee, my dad's farm, uh, right through the excitement of uh, flying in, the, in Vietnam and the, and the, the thrill, the chill. Uh, you relived all of that. And, and I found that to be very entertaining. Yeah, I can completely understand why. Um, would you say that it was easy for you to develop the title? Uh, I think it was choosing it rather than developing it. The harder I fall, the higher I bounce was kind of a family mantra uh, as I grew up. Uh, Dad would say, uh, quit crying. That's not acceptable. So you've fallen down, you've hurt your knee or something, and you got to get back up. So I learned about grit um, through many uh, events in my life. And so the harder I fall, the higher I bounce fit into what I wanted to do. I wanted to tell the stories of falling, and I wanted to tell the stories for the benefit of wannabe entrepreneurs, existing entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs that are having trouble with their business, I wanted to also encourage them that they could bounce back, that they could recover, that they could continue, maybe with these principles that are in each of the stories that are in the book. Okay, I see. Yeah, um, I can definitely see that your title reflects the entire premise of your book. Um, and I can see how that uh, the harder I fall, the higher I bounce would become a family motto of sorts. Yes, yes. Good motto to follow. Yeah, absolutely. And particularly as you go through the rest of your life from leaving your primary family, uh, you run into all of these obstacles of all kinds, challenges, sometimes even uh, very dramatically uh, difficult uh, to deal with. And so you take that and you move it forward. And so there were all of these harder I fall events that occurred in my life, some that were really damaging. And uh, you had to recover uh, from that damaged position. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that's not easy. No, you're right. It's not easy at all. How would you say this book has impacted your life so far? Well, I guess probably the most impactful thing once the book was out and published in, in the marketplace. I had feedback from people that I didn't expect telling me that uh, the book is sitting on the corner of my desk and I refer to it quite often. Or uh, young people uh, would write back or tell their parents, this is really good. I'm gonna take this book to college with me. And then others saying, uh, I've had a tough time. This encouraged me to get back. So getting those stories back from people, I don't think I really expected how impactful, to use your uh, word, how impactful that was going to be. Emotionally, it was just terribly satisfying. Okay, yeah, and I can only imagine how it would be so satisfying is the only word for it, how good it would make you feel. It makes you feel like it, maybe you wrote the book for yourself, for your own purposes, but you impacted other folks, which is a big, big deal. Yeah, that was, uh, and still is, by the way. I still get those emails and uh, back from people and uh, appreciating the story and the and the lesson and the principle and the encouragement. So, yeah, I think that's what's been most impactful. You write back to your fans? Sorry? You write back to your fans? Sure. Uh, not all of them. I can't. But, yeah, particularly the stories that, that I'm getting back. I try to. 
for one example, just a quick example, there was a young man uh, who had started a company and, and had some real success um, on a relatively small level. And he wrote me back and said that this, one of the stories, and I won't go into the story, but one of the stories in the book encouraged him and his wife to leave their business and to travel while they could around the world, uh, quite honestly, developing new businesses. But the story in the book says, and it's from my dad, if there's something you want to do, you probably should go ahead and do it now because it may be later in life that it's not that you want to be able to, it's that you want what to. Right. And right. so he read that and said, you know what, honey, we're going to do this. We're going to go. We're going to sell the house, sell the, let's go. And so they did. And uh, getting that story back and how, how much it, by the way, he started another very successful company already now that he's back. And so that just really was encouraging. Yeah, it would have encouraged me too, just to know that I inspired somebody, no matter what I inspired them to do, just to explore, to set their roots, whatever it may be, whatever is right for them. I'm glad I inspired them to follow their own path. Yeah, yeah. it was uh, it was great advice from my dad. Uh, he was very conservative, a financial tightwad, if you will. Uh, people said he still has the first dollar he ever made. And so when he said that to me, uh, you should go ahead, spend the money and do what you want to do now. That really surprised me. I said, are you sure? Is this my father talking to me, telling me to go spend money? And the lesson was, and I have learned it at this age, it's not that I can't go do things. It's just I don't have the same desires to go do anymore. Right, right. the motivation, if yeah. you will. Yeah, so the, those feed, that kind of feedback from people with those kinds of stories, and there are a bunch of those in the book, fortunately, so it really has been encouraging and impactful. That's wonderful. I'm happy for you. Thank you. What would you say your writing process is like? Do you plan before you write or do you write as you go along? <laughs> I guess probably a little bit of both. As I kind of mentioned earlier, um, it was easier to go back to the computer once I had written out the story. If, not not didn't write the stories out, but remembering what story it was that I thought would be beneficial. That's, I guess, being a planner and uh, on how you're going to do the book. And so I would write down all these stories and decide which ones I could tell and which ones I should tell. And uh, I learned a long time ago that in business, there's two really in marketing, particularly there's two really important things. Number one, it has to be entertaining. If you're making an infomercial or a commercial and, you know, you think of a dozen examples right off the top of your head. First of all, they entertain you. And then the second thing is there has to be a call to action. And so my call, my call to action was take these principles and do something with them or to move it back one step buy my book. And, uh, and therefore you'll benefit. So the stories are entertaining. And then the call to action is, this will work. Why don't you try it? I heard you say earlier that you found a lot of humor in your stories and you tried to keep it very lighthearted. But I also know that um, there's some heartfelt, heart-wrenching moments in there. So um, I'm sure there's a little bit for all of your readers and listeners, because I do know that your book is available as an audiobook. Super cool. Right, right. Uh, yeah, the uh, and thanks for bringing that up. Um, Jane Seymour, the actress and author and one of the world's greatest entrepreneurs, in my opinion, uh, caught that in in the book. The sitting on the my dad sitting on the front porch of his farm, his house on the farm, looking out over the fields, and just inside the door to his left, he was sitting in a swing on the front porch was my mom in a casket. She had passed away. And my dad, I was 13, my dad made the giant decision to leave this beautiful white house, farmhouse, looking out over his farm, and move to town, a little town in Tennessee. And we moved into the attic of a lady's home. And we slept in the same bed. 
and he sacrificed all of that. Now, put your mind here. Imagine moving. Now, you're on a tractor or following two mules out on the farm, his farm, and you look up to your right, and there on this little hill is the White House that you used to live in, but you sacrificed that so your son could continue with his extracurricular activities and so forth in town. And so he made this huge set. There's pathos, there's there's just, it's a very sad story, but, but it looked at the mentor that he became for me, that you sacrificed for things that you want. And he wanted me to have a great life and one better than him. And so he made that sacrifice. It, to me, it's just absolutely amazing looking back on that. Yeah, yeah, because I could only imagine as, see, I'm thinking about myself when I was 13. I could not tell you how mad I would be at my dad if he moved, we moved just because he wanted me to go to a different school. Oh, oh my God, I would be furious. Yeah. So yeah. looking back at it, you know, it's like, wow, you really did so much for me. And I was mad about it. Yeah. No, I wasn't mad. No? I wanted, no, I, I didn't really like farm work <laughs> as a teenager. <laughs> right. Right. And so Which going to, yeah, and he let me leave the farm, by the way, is another story in the book and why he did it. And, and basically he said, you really don't like working on this farm, do you? And I said, dad, I got to tell you, I just hate it. And he said, fine, you can go. And I said, who's going to take my place? And he said, that's not your problem. I'll handle it. So I went to town and got a job uh, later. This was later. But uh, yeah, I don't. I didn't mind leaving the farm. It wasn't like I left a bunch of friends. It was out right. in the country. Right. And, uh, you know, I left my dog. I left my horse and that sort of thing. But I was 13, you know, and you, know, you got other things on your mind when you're 13. <laughs> 13, you just want to do everything yeah in, join anything. the crowd in town yeah sure. yeah yeah so um if you had to expand on a single topic or a single story in your book which one would you expand on well that's really a tough question which story would i expand on probably my biggest failure uh, uh I guess explains maybe what the emotions can emotion can be like when you fail. I uh, was broke. I never filed bankruptcy, by the way, <clears throat> but I uh, always had that grit to bounce back, get out of it. But it was, was kind of a low point. And uh, I had been in network marketing before. And uh, a friend of mine says, uh, Max, I know that you're looking for something to do. I found a new network marketing company and uh, I think you ought to look at it. I said, what is it? And he said, uh, it's dog food. We're going to sell dog food on network marketing. And I said, really? He said, well, let me ask you, do you have a dog? Yeah. Do you feed your dog? Yeah. Do you know anybody else that has a dog? Yeah. Do they feed their dog? Yeah. So there's your market. Yeah. And I food said, never yeah. goes out of style. Okay. So maybe it's okay. So I said, I'll, I'll join. And, uh, I said, but I need some product so I can test the product. And he said, fine. So there was a, my knock on my door and I went to the door and opened it. And there's this fellow and he said, Mr. James, I have some dog food uh, for you that you ordered. And I said, fine, just bring it in the house. And he said, well, I don't think so. And I said, why not? And he said, well, come on out to, the, to my truck. And there was a full pallet of dog food, sacks of 25 pounds dog food stacked up on a pallet. And I said, what is all of this? And he said, well, that's what you ordered. I did? Well, the other guy ordered it for me. So anyway, he, he said, uh, I said, well, just leave it. And he said, no, I don't think you're gonna leave all of this out. So I said, well, put it in the garage, put it in the garage. The next morning I get up and I go down and there's skunks and rats and cats and dogs and oh. everything you can imagine outside my garage because they could smell the food. Well, they said it's buffet time. I won't tell you the next story, which is about the first time I went to somebody's house to present this opportunity, business opportunity and dog food. It was a total disaster. So I got back and I said, it's not going to, and I called them and they took the dog. But I think that was the low point in my life that I was as a network marketing distributor out trying to sell dog food 
uh, from the trunk of my car to people and talk and try to get them to do the same thing. That was the low point in my career. Yeah, I could, um, <laughs> I could see that. But I mean, at least it only went up from there. No, of course, I bounced back. You know, uh, right? that's gotta, one of those gotta, examples of the harder you fall, the higher you bounce. Yeah, uh, you know, opportunity doesn't knock on your door. Uh, you have to find opportunity. You have my, to mom, my mom always told me that if one door closes, you have to go searching through your house for what window opened because there's yeah. another opportunity, but it's not going to be in front of your face. You have to find yeah. it. You so my mom always told it. me, go searching. And, uh, perfect. And when you find it, you don't just nicely say, okay, this is going to work. You have to grab opportunity by the neck. You have to shake it and bend it and throw <laughs> it down and you'd make it yours. You don't yeah, just claim it because you go online and you can find how many opportunities by this solicit, you know, so yeah, opportunity, you have to go get it. That's one of yeah. the parts of bouncing back. You got to go get it. You got to go find it. You can't just sit <laughs> home twiddling your thumb or sucking your thumb. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, has publishing a book changed the way you see yourself? Probably not a lot. Uh, and I think maybe why that is my answer, it might be different than other people. I always told these stories all my life. I, I, I tell story about what happened when I was on the yacht of the world's richest man making a presentation or listening to a presentation or flying around in his private jet. Those stories I found interesting and and because of my being overly verbose, as you're discovering right now, uh, people seem to enjoy the stories. And so um, writing the story, I hoped I could do the same thing. So I don't know that it has changed my life. Retiring changed my life because I don't have an alarm clock anymore, which is <laughs> which is a very nice thing. And I have I don't want an alarm assets clock. with which I can give away and, and enjoy and philanthropy uh, became a big part of my life in many ways and uh, retiring gave me time to pursue being involved in some of the philanthropic activities more so than before it gave you the time to be able to really invest yourself exactly right okay that's actually really cool um so I know earlier you said that this is probably going to be the one and only book you ever write, <laughs> but was it therapeutic for you to write this book? Maybe. Or did you see it as like I, a chore? No, 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 no. I didn't really see it as a chore. Once I got to the, I don't know what I thought before I sat down and started doing this, but for some reason I was reluctant to, to do it. Um, I guess maybe... It was therapeutic. Uh, it certainly was reminiscing was fun. And thinking back to how much support I received from lots of people, especially my dad, my first and greatest mentor, uh, that was therapeutic. I, didn't, I, I realized that at the age of 13, I didn't realize how much sacrifice he was making and maybe how much sacrifice others were making. Um, uh, I lived out in the country and so, uh, people would let me spend the night in town if there was a basketball game I needed to play in or something. So that we didn't have this deal back and forth. I, I, that reminiscing was therapeutic to the point that it gave me the chance, at least internally to say thank you to so many people. Right. No, I completely understand. So it wasn't the book and writing itself but it's the emotions that it made you feel that were therapeutic very well said yes okay i see uh you mentioned earlier that your father was a uh farmer and he spent all his time working on the farm right do you think that him and the rest of your family would approve or disprove of your writing well, the family that's still alive, my brother, sister, cousins, uh, have been very complimentary about the book. 
I tried not to denigrate anyone that was mentioned in the book. Uh, that certainly wasn't the purpose of the book. Maybe I'll write that sometime in another book and you can publish it after I've gone. <laughs> uh, but no, I, my dad uh, often would say to me when nice things happen, son, I'm proud of you. And I think when he would have read, if he could have read my telling the stories about him and his mentoring and how much it meant to me, uh, uh, I think he would have been very, very much uh, in favor. As far as my mom, uh, she was sick for a long time with a brain tumor and passed, as I said, at a young age. Uh, so I don't, I don't really know the answer on, on that side. But all the other relatives, nobody's complained about, damn it, Max, why did you have to tell that? Story? No, I didn't hear any of that. <laughs> okay, wow. Um, I, now I, of course, have never met your father, just meeting you for the first time. Um, but I do have this great feeling that he would be very, very impressed with you and the work you've come up with so far. And I think that he would be, very glad he told you to leave the farm to explore your own <laughs> yeah i wasn't very good at it anyway okay and so <laughs> when my that's why uh, he wanted you to go yeah <laughs> that's a possibility when he said okay you can go you don't have to stay on the farm um uh, and i asked the question who's going to take my place and he said that's not your problem i think that showed support great support mm -hmm. uh, because he had to pay somebody else and you know right he was, and he didn't you know, have to pay you no it wasn't one of the great southern expressions you don't work hard enough to to earn the salt in your bread <laughs> but my dad said that day he said uh, i want you to remember this get away from that wheelbarrow you don't know anything about machinery <laughs> <laughs> So I wasn't that good. At, and that's in the book, too. If you're not, if you're not very, if, if you don't like what you're doing, you're probably not very good at it. Right. Uh, and that makes sense, too, because if you don't feel like you're adequate at something and you feel right. like you're not performing very well, you're not going to want to do it yeah. because it's embarrassing to say it lightly, you know? Yeah. 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 Uh, so if you had to describe yourself in only three words, what would those three words be? Resilience, mm -hmm. grit, determination. Yeah, I could get those three words uh, uh, upon reading your about the author and the about the book section. Um, I could definitely come to that conclusion. I wanted more. Uh, I wanted a bigger challenge. Uh, I wanted to take on something where uh, I would be challenged beyond what I thought I could do. Right. And uh, if you're into a job or, or, or an endeavor of any kind, and there's no opportunity to fail, then you're probably not being challenged enough. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with you. What advice would you give to somebody uh, who is looking to explore the way you did to find their own path? Go do it. Get to it. Get on it. You got to go for it. Being an entrepreneur and owning your own business or your own path, if you will, is is give it. It gives you a freedom. I mean, a giant, giant freedom that that you maybe won't have in in a bureaucratic, structured society. And so I'd say do it, but don't go for it if you don't just have the need to do it. I've got to do this. I must do this. If you're just thinking about it, you're not probably, you know, because failing is painful. I mean, it hurts to fall off the mountain that you're trying to climb. And so if you're not really ready, then don't become an entrepreneur. But if you really want to but if strive. if you're ready, don't hold back. Don't hold back. Give it all you got. Give it I all see. you can. 
Yeah. That, that's and, really uh, good advice. If you're ready, go for it. But if you're not ready, don't even worry about it. Yeah, don't do it. Don't do it. It's, you know, it's going to cause you misery. It's going to make people around you miserable. Oh, I'm failing. I shouldn't have done this. I spent too many. Hours. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. No, stay on the, got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Say. I just got a couple more questions for you before we wrap up the interview. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, uh, where can we purchase your book? If you have a website, please let us know what it is. Yeah, I have a website. It's uh, www.maxjamesauthor.com. www.maxjamesauthor.com. And uh, you can buy it there. Easiest is just to go into Amazon, look up the book or my name, and uh, it'll take you to the page. And then again, I, I feel strongly about this. Go down and read the endorsements. And if they don't appeal to you, don't waste your money. Don't buy the book. But That's if, good advice. But if any of those people's comments about the benefits of reading the book or experiencing my life story, if that appeals to you, buy the book and read it <laughs> and then take I, action. Your book is available in paperback, hardcover, and audiobook on both yeah. uh, the website and a CD. I saw that when I looked, and I think that's super cool um, because for some some folks just can't read as well. Um, I know my mom likes to read, but she's not very good at it. So audiobooks <laughs> would be audiobooks are great. So it's really good that you have that opportunity for people. And here's another advantage to that. When I was going through all of my growing up experience in business, uh, um, I was traveling a lot. Uh, I opened 400 manned stores and I opened 800 auto, what do you call it, uh, auto retail, the, the big vending machines, but this, oh, yeah. yeah, this automatic retail. And uh, I know as I travel from town to town to town to town to town, I mean, all the states and, and I put in a lot of miles. I'd stop at uh, a, a store and buy or rent an audio book. And I, so I got to the point where I advised people to work for me. You need to get a degree from auto university, meaning I learned so much by listening to those tapes by men and women who had the experience and I could learn from them. So uh, I have a lot of people that buy the auto book. Now, here's another good advantage of buying the auto book. I didn't do the narrating. So you don't have to listen to me and my damned old Southern accent. Okay. I mean, they got a guy on there and he talks a lot better than I do. <laughs> so anyway, it's a professional, it you. you know, yeah. it's a professional narrator and, and he does a really nice job. Okay. Yeah. I do. I personally would be interested if you had released another audiobook spoken by you. Because <laughs> when the author speaks their own audiobook, they can always take a moment and pause and be like, I know this isn't written in the book, but, and then they can expand on an idea. A narrator can't do that. No, I, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. Uh, the uh, statistics indicate that most of us aren't as good at reading as are these professional narrators on the book. And that's probably true, but it's an interesting point you make. They tend not to pause, even if they're not going to add anything, so that you get that dramatic impact of what the story is he just told. Yeah, Right. And there are little things like that, like the pausing and the restarting and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, inflections that a narrator just can't get if they didn't write it themselves. No, I think that's true. I think that's true. Do you have any other book related thoughts or remarks you'd like to make? Uh, by the book. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and fortunately, I mean, God's been really good to me. And so fortunately, uh, I'm not saying that because I want the money or need the money. I'm saying that because uh, I didn't know if my product, the book, was going to be very good or not. As it turns out, it was a great surprise to me that it has been so well received by leaders, uh, people that I have great respect for. And so I look, that's why I say go read their stuff. I look to them as the judge, not me. But apparently we have a good product. 
And so I would say it's probably worthwhile for almost everyone that's interested in life lessons. Jack Canfield, who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul, best-selling author of all except uh, the Bible. Uh, he sold over 500 million books. I mean, that's pretty good, don't you think? Jack Canfield's a friend of mine, and he's done an interview with me, which I really appreciated. And he said, again, Max, this book is not just for entrepreneurs. It's for all people because there's so many good life lessons, not just principles for entrepreneurs. So I would say to everybody, uh, I put a lot of effort into the book. I'm proud of it because other people seem to be benefiting from it. And so take a few minutes and uh, uh, see if you don't think the book might benefit you also. Right. Um, and to go back to that audio book uh, point, um, you can always listen to a sample of the audio book to see if you're interested. And me personally, that's my favorite way to see if I'm interested in a book. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you go on the website, we give you three chapters for free. That's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and for my final question, I just want to know, how has your experience with Bookmark Alliance been so far? Uh, I judge the people that I've dealt with, including you, Penny, uh, as being highly professional. And when they spot something that they think is worth the effort of your organization and your staff, they really go after it. And so I've also been, as an old salesperson, I've also been impressed with their sincerity uh, about being able to help and, uh, and the ease of communication. So I would say so far, it's been really great. And uh, I've enjoyed this time with you, Penny. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, I'm glad that we could provide services that you're happy with. If you ever think of anything that you're like, oh my goodness, this would be great. Tell <laughs> us because we're absolutely willing to hear it all. We're always looking to better our company. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, ma'am. Um, yeah, uh, that's all the questions I have for you today. So thank you so much for discussing your book with me. Um, and thank you My for pleasure. giving me some insight into your book as well. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. I look forward to any opportunities to speak to you in the future. And I hope you come back for another interview. <laughs> so thank you. I'm sure I uh, will. Yeah. My name is Penny Edmark, and this is Max James, the author of The Harder I Fall, The Higher I Bounce. Uh, have a wonderful day, and thank you so much to our wonderful listeners for tuning in. Have a nice day and stay safe. Good day.